Not a lot, right? All right. Glad, I'm glad to be in the house of the Lord. I'm glad to be among God's people. I'm thankful. Tuesday night we have uh, worship practice. First of all, I want to say I'm thankful for our worship team, our worship leader that um, wants to put give their very best to God so that we gather about twice a month every other week to uh, practice to make sure that we know the songs, that we can do our very best whenever we lift up the name of Jesus, which I think is a good thing. So the first thing I get, the first conversation I enter into when I get to um, here at practices, um, uh, Brother Kenneth and uh, some of the Hagers were there last year, and uh, Brother uh, Rick's going to help also, but uh, we're going to set up a tent for a, a, a sorority group of young men that walked from Troy to Panama City to raise money for the Wounded Warrior Project. In other words, these men or these young guys are taking off their spring, taking part of their spring break to raise money for those that have been uh, injured in war. So to God be the glory. Amen. They're, they're going to supply these guys, give them something to drink and socks, whatever they need. So to God be the glory. And the last conversation we had leaving was our young, our, our leaders of our young people. Um, having some ideas of what we can do to reach our young people. Amen? In other words, God is at work. And I'm thankful for the ministry that's coming out from this church. I thought of myself when I got home. That a city on a hill cannot be hid, right? And so the light's going to go out. Everybody around is going to see that city on a hill. And so ministry is coming out from this church, and I'm thankful for it. In other words, they instigated that. And then, of course, as Sister Tammy uh, mentioned this morning, we had the men's fellowship and we got a lot of work done. We had a good time of fellowship. We had some good food. And much was accomplished. Had a good spirit here. I know I enjoyed it. And I appreciate the guys that came out. So I'm thankful for the things that God's doing. There is good news. Amen. There's good news in amongst all this. So again, I'm thankful for you guys. Thank you for uh, all that you contribute. Day in and week in and month in and out. Thank you for that. All right. Uh, we've been talking about taking every captive uh, taking every thought captive, talking about our mindset. We, uh, we all face battles with our mind and our, our thinking and our emotions, so uh, we're going to continue that thought. Uh, the first week we talked about worry and anxiety. We know that uh, this world is like a pressure cooker, and, it, and so many people are under stress. So many people are uh, dealing with anxiety. So many people are dealing with uncertainty. So many people are dealing with loss, both, both of of, of, of physical loss and um, material loss and the, lo the loss of loved ones. And so this world is like a pressure uh, cooker. And we know that that's not new to the kingdom of God. That's not new to God's word. So through God's word, we've seen an example. Uh, the Bible tells Philippians, it tells us how to uh, uh, overcome worry by rejoicing in the Lord and giving praise and letting our request be known to God with thanksgiving. And we talked about last week, grief. That's, con that's in this, this human uh, condition that we're in. We know that grief is common. And we saw uh, Hannah, that it, it appeared that her uh, desire to have a child would never be accomplished. We'd never see it happen. But we realized that she gave it to God. She prayed there on the altar before God. And God heard her cry. God heard her vow. And she said, Lord, if you give me a son, I'll give him back. And she did. And we spoke about how Jesus, we, we uh, came right in the middle of grief and grief. Uh, bereavement of loss of Lazarus. He was not distant. He came to the scene where Lazarus was laid and he comforted those. And not only that, he comforted, but he, he showed that he is our resurrection. Yes. He is li In him is life. And he spoke and Lazarus came forth. And so we know that he, in our grief, we know that, that Jesus is there also. Yes. And today we're going to talk about we could talk about anger. Again, uh, when God put us together, he gave us some emotions. And one of the emotions that he gave us was anger. And we're going to talk about uh, how anger, uh, again, again, it is a God-given emotion. But we know that if we're, when we're weary, whenever we're uh, beaten down, whenever we're uh, not, um, when we express anger in a way that's not pleasing to God, we can get out of hand. It can cause much damage. So we realize uh, there's a good side to, emotion, uh, to anger, and there's also a harmful side. We've seen probably both sides. So if you would, please stand for, as we read God's Word, it's found in Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, we'll start in verse 26, we'll jump a couple of scriptures and then we'll pick up in verse 30. Ephesians chapter 6, I'm sorry, Ephesians chapter 4, starting with verse 26. Ephesians 4 and 26. And it reads, Be angry and do not sin. Do not let, sun, do not let the sun go down on your wrath nor give place to the devil. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, 
wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Let's read that last verse one time. He's speaking to people that are in the house of God. These are talking about uh, Christian people. Be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Thank you for standing for God's word. Let's say one more prayer this morning. Join with me as we pray. Lord, help us today to speak your word. Help us to speak it in truth and in love. God, we, your word is anointed, but God, I pray to you use us today, God, to speak your word, Lord. Help us to apply it to our life, and we give you the glory, we give you the honor. In Jesus' name we pray, we thank you. Amen. Amen. We're talking about taking anger captive. We, we uh, again, we, we have our thought life, and there's times when we're bombarded with thoughts, and those thoughts can drift, cause us to drift away from God. Those yes. thoughts can cause us to get out of God's will. Yes. Those thoughts can begin uh, cause us to begin to doubt things. Uh, just like that song we sung, um, I'll, I'm going to believe what God says about me. Yes. We have those voices in our head that tell us well, we're not this, or you'll never see this accomplished, or you should have done this. And That's a constant battle, those voices in our head. You don't have to be schizophrenic to hear a voice in your head, I assure you. You'll hear those voices in your head telling you that you're not enough or this will never be accomplished or, or and on and on. You know what I'm talking about this morning. And so we're going to talk about taking it captive. We do not have to be dominated by those thoughts is what we want to remember this morning. Take our anger captive. And just as if a robber were to come into your house to cause your family harm or cause your uh, 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 your property would be gone. You would take that person, do everything within your ability to take that person captive. You would try to neutralize that person. And that's what we have to think about whenever these thoughts come into our mind. We have to neutralize them. We have to cast them out of our mind. Yes. Whenever uh, anger swells up in us and it wants us to cause harm to another person, it wants us to bring a fire to a situation, we have to take that captive. Yes. So we have to uh, remember that First of all, anger is an emotion. God himself gets angry, but we realize that God is just. Yes. God is righteous. Everything God does is out of his holy nature. I'm not, I'm not there. I'm, I'm in the flesh. I'm, up, I'm in this fleshly tabernacle. But we, uh, so we know that anger within itself is not sin. It's how we deal with our anger. Yes. Amen? It's just like a gun. It's, there's been... Well, I won't get off on that, but it's who's behind that gun. In other words, if an evil person is behind that gun, evil's going to take place. If a righteous person is behind that gun, then it's only going to be used for a righteous matter. Amen? And so it's the same way with our anger. Anger within itself is not evil. It's what we do with it. Yeah. Remember, Jesus became angry. Whenever he came to the house of God, uh, we talked about this is a place of prayer. We believe in prayer. We exercise that prayer. And so whenever we come into this house, we know this is a setting which you can pray. Yes. You can pray by yourself or you can play, pray in a congregation. Yes. We want to make sure that the, the, the setting is right, that there's not a lot of distractions that we can pray. He entered into that temple and he heard goats bleating and he heard sheep carrying on and he heard people exchanging money. He seen fraud going on in the house of the God. There's so much noise and junk going on. You could not get your mind on God. That's what the house of God was all about. It was a place of worship, not a place for a person to get uh, to take an advantage of because those were wanting to make money through the sacrifice that uh, God had required at that time. And so he braided up a whip and he got him out of there. Amen. Jesus got angry. He took his anger and used it in a way that was positive. When it was all said and done, the, the temple was cleansed of that filth and that carrying on that was hindering people from doing what God had called them to do. Amen? So we realize, hey, Jesus had anger, but he used it in the right manner. He's, he was perfect. He was controlled. Yes. And, we're, and sin, God gets angry at uh, sin. Sin offends the character of God. Yes, it does. When nations or individuals reject his love and goodness, God becomes angry. We see example after example in the Old Testament where God gave his law, God gave his prophets, God... Uh, Provided every blessing possible, financial blessing, blessings of peace to God's people. And yet, instead of a bow to the, to the almighty God, to the creator of heaven and earth, they would go out to the woods and they'd give them a piece of wood and they would coat it with a precious metal, maybe silver or gold, and they would build a little sanctuary and they would worship that idol because that was something they created. And God got angry. 
I'm the God of heaven. He said, I can hold the waters of the hand. You go out to the Gulf of Mexico, you couldn't measure that to save your life. But he says, I can hold that water in the palm of my hand. Look at those mountains that surround Jerusalem. I weigh them in a scale. And you're bound to a piece of wood with some gold covered it? Are you crazy? God made, him, God made, made God angry. Yeah. Because it's ridiculous. Yeah. It's ridiculous. The God, the God that put the stars in place. I'm the God of heaven. I'm the God that set, knows the ending from the beginning. Before it even starts, I know how it's going to end. And you're bound to an idol that cannot see, that cannot hear, and cannot speak. Yes. So God became angry. Yes. And he would cause judgment to come on his people because of, their, because of their lack of love toward him. Amen? And that's something to get angry about, right? Mm -hmm. And so God would, um, would um, allow, he would allow a calamity to come on his yes. people yes. to bring him back to himself. God would much rather for us to repent than yes. to cause calamity on us. That's Amen. Right. But God would do what he had to do to draw him back into himself. <clears throat> the Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4. Verses 6 and 7. Anger has been with us since the very beginning. Uh, this is the first family. Uh, the two first children of Adam and Eve, Cain. And the Lord said to Cain, Why are you so angry? Why has, it, why has your countenance fallen? Verse 7, if you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door. It's its desire for you. Listen to this. But you should have rule over it. So whenever you read the story, whenever you read just ahead of that, Cain and Abel have grown. And, and, and Abel is a person that keeps flocks of sheep. And, and Cain is a person that tills the land. And he uh, grows produce and crops and so forth. And so the time to offer sacrifice, Cain, uh, Abel brought his sacrifice. He brought those sheep. The Bible says he brought the first, the first, uh, the first, <laughs> first fruit. There we go. The firstborn. He brought his very best. He brought it to the Lord and he sacrificed it. In other words, that first, God wants that first. There's always a first. We don't know when the end is going to come, but there's always a first. And so he brought that first lamb, that, that precious lamb, and he brought it and he sacrificed it to the Lord. And the Lord was pleased with it. Abel did it according to God's plan. He did God's way, God's will, God's way. So Cain came and he brought his vegetables. He just brought some vegetables. He didn't bring the first. He didn't bring the best. It was, his whole heart was not in it. And so God did not accept it. God laid the plan out to Cain. This is what it is, Cain. This is what it's going to take. But yet uh, he didn't do it the God's way. So guess what? He got angry over it. And so God spoke to him and said, Cain, why are you so angry? Had you done it my way, I would have accepted it. Sin is at the door. Its desire is for it to take over you. But I don't want it to take captive of it. In other words, he says, yeah. don't let your anger get away from you. Go back and make it right and I'll accept it. Just that simple, amen? Yes. Cain took the other route. He went out to the field. Him and Abel were out there uh, in the field. And the Bible says that Cain struck his, his brother Abel and killed him. The first, it's hard to believe there was murder in the first family, but according to God's word, there was. Why is it? Because he came angry. He became angry at God. He became angry at Abel because it didn't go his way, but he didn't go the right way. He wasn't on the right path. Amen? Yeah. It's like me going from here to Chipley at 85 miles an hour and a police uh, pulls me over. And he writes me a ticket and me getting angry. Well, why am I so angry? I was out of, I was out of line. It was, it's not his fault. It was my fault I was going 85 miles an hour. Amen? And so that, it's, the same, it's the same parallel. So we've got to ask ourselves, why am I so angry? Why am I so angry? Is there a reason for it? The Bible tells us in Proverbs chapter 19, verse 19, a man of great wrath will suffer punishment. Cain was a man where his anger got the best of him. He suffered punishment. The Lord struck him. In other words, he cursed him. He said, from now on, this, this land is not going to work with you. There's some people that can stick a seemingly a dry stick in the ground and come back later and it's growing, right? And then there's others that can have, be an isle the best land in the world and, and can't even make weeds grow. Well, that's what came from that time on because he was cursed because, you know what, he got out of God's... Uh, God, had a God, God put a curse on him for his sin. For if you rescue him, you will have to do it again. And that's the last part of that verse. But God, the Bible says, great wrath, the, a man of great wrath will suffer punishment. Cain gave way to his anger, and as a result, he murdered his, his own brother. He murdered Abel, the first recorded murder that, murder that we have. The first family felt the pain of death. 
Cain was cursed because God, Cain didn't take his anger captive. Yeah. He had opportunity. God spoke to him said, this is what you do. You take control of it. And he didn't. So when we become angry, we have to ask ourselves, what's going on here? Is, is this something I brought on myself? What do, I, what do I need to do about this anger? There's a way out. In other words, God opened the door. The Bible says with every temptation, there's a door of escape. God swung that door wide open for Cain, but he refused to walk through it. So we need to ask ourselves when we're angry, or angry about something, what is it that I need to do about this? You know, a few years ago, there was a, a person that I knew. I got very angry about the little symbols that the state puts whenever somebody loses their life along the highway. And he got very angry with it. And, you know, I, I, I sit there and I listen to him. And he really went off on it. And I said to myself, you know, where I, what I do and who I am, I really, I couldn't impact that. But where he was at and the position that he had and the place that he was in life, that he could do something about that. He could go uh, knock on some doors. He could make some calls and he could make a change in that situation. So telling me about his, about this, how much it angers him really wasn't going to benefit any, anything. But there was people that he could speak to and make a difference. And you know, that's what I'm asking this morning. Is there something that I need to do about my anger? Am I venting at my wife about something that I need to go to someone else and speak to uh, to, uh, to see a problem, uh, to, to see a situation turned around? Does that make any sense this morning? And of course, I'm thankful that my wife uh, is there that I can vent. But uh, at the same time, I have to realize, hey, there may be someone else that really needs to hear this. In other words, is God using our anger to bring us to a place to make a difference. Right. Just being at home, seething about something, it, 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 it just damages me. But when I take that anger as a motivation, for instance, you see children that are not getting enough to eat. Right. Or you see children that are not taken care of. So what is God speaking to you? Are you to be more involved in their life? Is there an, an area that you can relieve that suffering? Amen? And so is God using our anger? Is God, are we dealing with this anger? For God to move us into a place that we can make a difference. Right. Amen? Right. Because again, anger in itself is not, it's, it's an emotion that we have. God put it there for a reason. It can be a great motivator. Yes. Are, we get, are we using that motivation just to vent ourselves or to walk forward into an area that we can bring change? For instance, the uh, organiza organization MAD. A woman did get mad because her son was killed by a drunk driver. She took that anger. And she vented it, and she put it in a, into a direction where there's no telling how many lives have been saved because of that. There's no, many to, uh, no telling how much good this anger has done since then because she put her anger into the right direction. And many other organizations were uh, founded for such as that. So that's what I'm asking this morning. That's the question we need to ask ourselves. If, is this what I'm angry about? God, is God put this in my heart to, to make a change, for me to step out and do something to make a difference in, in this world that we live in. The Bible tells us in James chapter 1 and verse 19 and 20, it says, So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. For the wrath of God, listen to me, for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. So in other words, when I'm just impulsive, and I'm impulsive because of my anger. I'm not going to carry out the righteousness of God. When I'm just spewing or I'm just trying to vent on somebody that uh, I just want to focus my anger on a person or a circumstance, then I'm not working out the right righteousness of God. But when I slow it down, when I take time to listen to the whole situation, there's been times I've got angry over a situation I didn't know the whole story. Later, I got the whole story that made a little more sense to me. And when I'm slower to speak, in other words, if I'm not speaking, I'm listening. When I have to slow it down a little bit and I take time to let God speak to me right. and to hear the other end of the story because I, the one thing I have learned, if I've not learned anything else, there's two sides of the coin. Yeah. There's two sides of the story. Sometimes we hear one side and we don't hear the other side. And man, we can get really uh, out of joint for a while until we hear the whole story. And so sometimes it just takes a slowing down and say, let me, there's, probably, there's probably something I'm not knowing here. There's probably another part of the story I've not heard yet. And so we need just to remember that this morning, to be slow to speak, swift to hear. Take time to hear it out. Take time to know about it, but slow it down. Slow to spout off. Don't always say the first word that comes to mouth. Amen? Slow her down and think about it. And let God help you with that. Amen? He is a very present help in time of trouble. And when your anger is going to blow the top off, you're going to blow the top on your anger, God is with us. He will help us. Amen? He will help us. 
Cain, had Cain listened to God, the ending would have been much different. Had he slowed her down and says, you know, let's make the sacrifice. Let's do it right. God, you're here to help me. But he didn't. He gave in to his anger and his wrath. And what is wrath? Wrath is that vengeful anger. Uh, we see it in that retaliation against Abel, which led to that murder. Abel was innocent and all that. He just done what, he, what it was asked of him. He just, what he did was pleasing to God, but yet Cain uh, vented his anger on him. He didn't turn, didn't look at himself and say, you know what, Cain, uh, this, is, this is the deal. Just make it right. He didn't do that. He vented it on somebody innocent. That's too, too many times we see that. We see somebody vent their anger on somebody who's totally uh, innocent. We see that in child abuse. You see some person that's just mad at the world. And they come home and they got, to, they got to vent their anger on somebody. So they vent it on either their wife or some kid in the household. That's a terrible thing. Amen. We see the, we see the ravage that anger in our uh, culture has caused. This um, uh, road rage. Somebody cuts you off, makes you two, two and a half minutes late for work, and, you, and somebody's ready to run them down and kill them over that. Amen. Or two and a half minutes late to go down to the uh, local convenience store to buy a Pepsi or whatever. You know, it's just. It's, it's, we see uh, anger uncontrolled in our culture. Yes, we do. But God, 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 we don't have to be that way whenever we take that af anger captive. Yes. Yes. Listen to this verse uh, in Romans chapter 12, and verse 19, very familiar. When it comes to dealing with our anger, this is one of the ways that we can take our thoughts captive. Listen, in Romans 12 and 19, it says, Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written... Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Yes. Vengeance is mine, I will repay. Cain, Cain's anger was not perfect like God's anger. Amen? His per, we see where he killed Abel because of it. The Bible says, vengeance is mine. If somebody cuts you off intentionally on the way, that don't happen a lot here in Vernon. Let's just be real. It just don't happen a lot. But if someone causes anger in your life, someone is a continual source of, of uh, irritation, you know what? You need to remind yourself, vengeance is the Lord's. He's perfect in what he does. Yes, he if, I, if I allow my will to be carried out, I'm going to do wrong. I'm going to bring shame to your name. I'm, they see my car out here. They know that I'm the pastor of the local church. i got to remember that because you know what? When I offend somebody, there's people watching. And when, I, when I act out of character, people are watching. They judge this church. They judge the rest of my whole life over that one event. So we need to be careful. We need to slow it down and say, you know what? This hurt me. This looks like it was intentional. But vengeance is yours, Lord. You know exactly what to do. I'm not perfect in that matter. I'm going to put that to you. I'm going to give that to you, Lord. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. It's a lot easier said than done sometimes, but it's the truth. We've got to give vengeance to the Lord. We see a lot of injustice in our culture. We see a lot of things going on. Uh, to people in our in our, our society, and it's easy, it's easy to get uh, angry about it. It's easy to get consumed by that anger. So we need to ask ourselves the question: What is it that I can do about it? Is there something that I need to do? Is that why this feeling is stirred up? And then when we've answered that question, we have to remember that those that are creating this trouble, those that are creating this injustice, those that are doing harm to one another. They may be outside the hand of the law, so to speak, but we cannot stay up at night worrying about that. We have to say, vengeance is yours, Lord. Yes. You will repay. Yes. God sees everything that's done. Yes, he, he knows does. every tear that drops from your eyes. Yes, Amen? He, he knows every tear. He knows every time uh, you're, a mo you're, you're damaged, all right? Vengeance is the Lord's. Thank you, Jesus. Take our grudges captive. Number two, take our grudges captive. Notice what it tells us in Ephesians 4 and 26. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. No, in verse 27, nor give place to the devil. When, in, when possible, go to the person we are angry with and speak to them yeah. instead of everybody else. Right. Speaking to everybody else, where that's the, the story down at the Dollar General or Circle H or wherever else, uh, that's not going to change anything. But you know what? Where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there also. And you know what? Whenever we think of that verse, we think about small congregations. We think about um, 
uh, people gathered at a church or a worship or a prayer meeting and we say, well, there's not a lot of us, but God's in our midst. But can I tell you this morning, whenever you gather to bring reconciliation to a situation and there's two of you, did you know that God is in the midst yes, because is. God is all about reconciliation? Yes, Why did Jesus come to bring reconciliation to the human race? Yes. He is all about reconciliation this morning. And you know what? You may not have all the answers when you leave out to speak with that person, but you can trust that the Lord of heaven is there that day. He's there where Wherever we meet to bring reconciliation because he's all about it. So we need to remind ourselves when it's possible. What are you saying, Brother Chris? There are times when it is not possible to meet with that person. That person uh, is, is not agreeable to it. They're not in a position that anything would be accomplished. And not only that, there are people, uh, I don't know about in this congregation, but there's, there's definitely people that uh, may hear this on a, a, by way of online or we come in contact with our anger with people who are long dead and gone. They're long dead and gone, but yet there's still that anger. There's still that rage of what had happened in that, in that time where they were living. So how do we deal with that? We forgive it. Yeah. We write it out. And we write, out a, a, we write it out. We say, you know, your name and that person's name. And, and this is what you've done to me. And this is what caused me. And this, this is the harm. But I forgive you through the name of Jesus Christ. And you yeah. take it to a good fire and burn, burn it, scorch it. Yeah. That's how you deal with somebody that's not here. If that's what it takes, because there are times when we're angry at people that we cannot come in contact with. It's impossible for us to come in contact. Write it out and burn it. Forgive it. Why? Because God forgive us. Christ forgave us. Amen? Thank you, Jesus. Speak with gentleness. Put yourself in their shoes. Now, would you want somebody just to come and unload on you? Would you like to feel the full force of somebody's fury on you? Especially when you're not expecting it? Of course you wouldn't. Speak with gentleness. Why, why is that in the scripture? Why, why would he have to tell Christian people, be kind to one another. Be considerate of one another. Because we get stirred up. Our emotions sometimes, that's, that, when, our, when our emotions are not captured, then that's what happens. Or whenever we allow the, the, the God of this world, which is Satan, to antagonize us, to uh, get our emotions all stirred up, that's sometimes what comes out. Whenever we step out of the spirit and step into the flesh, that's what comes out. We, be, we can become harsh. We can become, uh, uh, we can allow our anger to be, anger to be like uh, errors piercing through another person's soul. So gee, to the word of God tells us to be kind to one another. Be kind to one another. You'd be, you'd be surprised what a difference it makes. The Bible tells us in uh, Proverbs chapter 15, a soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. A soft answer turns away wrath, but a, heart, but a harsh word stirs up anger. So we all know what happens when you throw gas on a fire. Whenever you throw gas on a fire, it, it, it's a big explosion right now. So whenever somebody is on the other end, they're already stirred up, their emotions are stirred up, and you hit them with a hard word, guess what? You're going to get a reaction. And it's not going to be pleasant. But the soft, a, a, a soft word makes a difference. Several years ago, uh, we raised watermelons. And uh, it happened that we, um, the, the season was not the best. Uh, we had a lot of rain. Melons did not keep well. When you get a lot of rain, people think watermelon, they need rain every day. They do not. They don't need, they don't need a lot of rain. So anyway, long story short, um, we had, I had a watermelon buyer that was what not, was not wanting to pay me for my, some of the melons we had sent them. That was a lot of work. It was a lot of expense. And it looked like he, he wanted to get out of paying me. So um, I called the guy. And um, actually the county agent said that um, in the situation we're in, you know, he was obligated to pay me. There's not a written contract, but he was obligated to pay me. And so uh, I, through his counsel, I said, you know, if he does not want to pay you, then you take it to the attorney general. I said, all right, so we'll just take this step at a time. So I called the guy and said, man, you, you, you had to set the check, and, and so uh, we've got to do something about this. And so he went on about this, that, and the other, and I said, well, uh, if you're not going to pay me, you'll be hearing from the uh, attorney general in a few days. I just said him like that, and we hung up the phone. It's been a good time to get angry, right? We worked hard. I mean, it's a, it's, it's a job. It's a job raising a watermelon. It's a job, job raising anything. And so a little bit later on, he gave me a call. I got a call. It was him. He said, you know what? Uh, I'm not a cheat. I didn't start being a cheat. I'm not going to cheat. He said, you'll get your money. In other words, a soft answer. Turned, it could've, we could have excited that situation. I could have told him what I really thought, but I said, you know what? I'll just tell him what's going to happen. We'll leave it. And God worked that thing out. 
But if I got all stirred up about it, it may not have ended that way. I made a fool of myself, and, and we don't know how it would have ended. But you know what? We allowed God to work in that situation. We done it according to his word. We gave a soft answer. Okay, that's the rapture table. This is what's going to happen. And God worked it out. And I realize not every situation may work out that way. But whenever we do it God's way, we have his blessings. Yes. We know that. Amen? Amen? So speak with gentleness. Unresolved anger leads to bitterness. What does the Bible say whenever it says, do not let your son go down, do, do, do not let the sun go down upon your wrath. Go ahead and deal with it. Because whenever we refuse to deal with it, it festers and it grows. And we know that an infection in the body, if it's not dealt with it, if it's an infection that your body cannot defend itself against, you need some outside help. You need that antibiotic. Otherwise, that infection will continue to grow. And it's eventually going to shut it down. It's going to eventually get in the bloodstream and it can cause death, right? That infection left unchecked. So it is with bitterness. If, it's, if, we're not, if we do not deal with that anger, it will lead to bitterness. And that bitterness will put a wedge between us and other people. It will put a wedge between us and God. There's nothing worse than to see a bitter old man. To see a person that's spent their whole life and they've had a lot of They've had things happen or whatever, but they've allowed bitterness to set up in their soul. And it doesn't matter how pretty the day is, it's not pretty enough. It doesn't matter how pretty good the shoes is, it's not good enough. Everything is bad. Everything is sour. Everything is tainted because of that bitterness. There's no uh, loving relationships in that life because, you know what, they've allowed bitterness to take control. And that is a root. A root is something that starts small, but it continues to grow. It's different from a seed. And you can, you, that root, it'll grow. And it has to, in order, the way to get rid of a root, you have to pull it all out. You can't leave one little piece because if you want to leave one little piece, it'll set roots down and it'll continue to grow again. And so it is with that bitterness. We need to be, uh, we need to root it out. We need to ruthlessly root out bitterness out of our life. We need to ruthlessly get anger, unresolved anger out of our life because it will cause trouble. It will it will canker our soul. It will uh, it will spoil our soul. Amen. Whenever we allow bitterness to take place, I assure you, within walking distance of this church, there's there's a multitude of people that have been hurt in church or hurt by church people. And rather than dealing with that, rather than taking it to God, rather than Put those other people that have hurt them under the blood. They've seethed over that and they've created bitterness in their life. And now they, they're distant from God. They're, 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 prayer, they're not putting up prayers for God. There's no active testimony in their life because they've allowed bitterness to overtake their soul. Yes. We have to deal with it. Yes. Yes. We have to deal with it. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Unfortunately, I've, I've lived long enough to see that. They just allow bitterness. They've not taken that root. They played with it, and that root has grown and it has uh, overshadowed. It's filled their heart rather than the love of God. Yep. Take our anger captive. How do we do that? We forgive. We forgive. How do we defuse or disarm this anger that we have? How do we? How do we? How do we? You know, some fires. Some fires you put water on. Other fires you don't. You put some something else on it. Electrical fires, you don't put it out with water. You put it out with a chemical, right? How do you, so you diffuse that. How do we diffuse this fire in our soul with this anger? If we're not in a position to do something about it, if there's not a, then we, then we forgive. We forgive that person that's caused this or this institution, whatever the case might be, we forgive that person. That puts, that takes the air out of the fire. When you take the air out of the fire, the fire will die, right? Fire needs fuel, and fire needs oxygen, oxygen to do its thing. And so whenever that fire of anger is in our soul and it's consuming us, how do we diffuse it? How do we take it captive? We forgive. Yes. And by what basis? We have to look back in our own self. God, you have forgiven me yes. completely. Yes. You've forgiven me completely. Yes. That gives me that gives me the ability to forgive another one completely. Yes. I have received. I can't give what I, I can't give what I've not received. I've received forgiveness. God, you've been forgiven of me. God, you've been merciful for me. God, you've looked down on me when I was not worthy. And God, you forgave me. And so I can forgive others. Because yes. of that, I can forgive others. That's how we diffuse that fire in our soul. Forgive completely, regardless of another person's actions. Yes. Brother Chris, are you saying you don't know what they've done to me? I do not know. But I do know you can you can forgive. You know what? The Bible says when we when we hate or we have anger for no cause, 
we have an anger, uh, 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 anger toward another. The Bible says it's the same as murder. And I can tell you, I've, been, I've, I've had that kind of anger from time to time. And you know what? God forgave me. In God's eyes, it's the same as murder. So God forgives, right? He forgave me of that. When I was so angry, uh, I was so angry. It was that God compares that hate to, to, to murder. So God has forgiven us of that. It doesn't get any higher than that, does it? Murder? If God will forgive me of that anger, that left unresolved could turn out like Cain or something like that. Hey, I can forgive those that have caused me damage or those that have caused me harm or those that have gotten the best of my emotions. But you know why? Because God has forgiven me. Yes, he has. God has forgiven me. Remember, whenever we ask for forgiveness to, to God, whenever I pray, the Bible says, uh, if we call out, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us. Amen? Yes. That's right now. That's good right now. That's just like a $5 bill. I give Tammy a $5 bill. It's worth $5 right now. But in our own lives, remember, sometimes this takes a process for us. Sometimes we, uh, again, it's all about taking those thought captains. Whenever we forgive somebody, it happens right then. The, the devil, the accuser of the brethren, that one that stirs up our emotions, the ones that keeps us on edge, whenever he brings those thoughts back into our mind, and it, it, it re, he wants to re, he wants to blow a flame, uh, blow a wind on, that, on those little embers, and try to get a flame going again. Remember, it's a process, and and snuff it out. Remember, it's a process with us, instantaneous with God. But sometimes it takes us a time to work through. We have to, uh, we just have to take in God's grace. We have to take in God's word. We have to take in God's goodness. But we realize, give yourself time. Give yourself time. Continue to work at it this morning. Amen. Yes. Take your captain. Take your anger, Captain. Forgive. Because God forgave us. Yes, he did. Part of forgiveness is letting go of the need for revenge or the need to punish the one who created the hurt. Yes. We have to let go of again. Remember, vengeance is God. If there's something that needs to be done about that, God will take care of it. Yes, he he's big enough, yes, he but he's going to do it right. God's a surgeon. He, he'll take care of just what needs to be taken care of. Amen. Take your thoughts captive. Whenever you become angry, and it's it's driving your driving your emotions and it's driving your actions, take it captive. You wouldn't want to be in a car with a monkey driving, would you? That would be bad. And so it is. Whenever we allow anger to to to, to direct our steps, it's, it's going to turn out bad. So take it captive this morning, as Brother Greg plays. Let's, let's receive this word into our heart this morning. If you deal with anger, take it captive. That's the freedom that we have in Jesus Christ. You're going to go to work in the morning and probably you're going to deal with people that are given to anger. And you see it spew out. Or you may find yourself in a, in a charged situation. We don't have to live that way. And those ones that are uh, spewing out that anger, we're gonna, we can take our mind captive. We can take our emotions captive. He's a shield to us. You probably won't have somebody shoot you with an arrow when you get to work, but you may have somebody that hit you with some hard words. But remember, God is a shield to us, and he, He'll protect us. He doesn't get us out of the battle. He protects us in the battle. 